Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the University and the Centre for Advanced Journalism. My name's Margaret Simons. I'm the director of the centre, and it's my pleasure tonight to welcome Professor Matthew Ricketson to address us. Um, just a little bit of background, first of all. Most of you in this audience, I imagine, will be familiar with the News of the World telephone hacking inquiry. It was in that context that last September the federal government appointed an independent inquiry uh, to look into media standards in Australia and to report to the Convergence Review, which was a much larger exercise looking at media regulation in the broad. Um, Matthew Ricketson was appointed to assist the chair of that inquiry, Mr Ray Finkelstein QC. Now, Dr Matthew Ricketson is a professor of journalism at the University of Canberra. Um, he's worked in both the news media industry and in universities during his career, which began in 1981. He's worked on staff at The Australian, at Time Australia magazine, and between 2006 and 2009 as media and communications editor of The Age. Ricketson ran the journalism program at RMIT for 11 years, and he's the author of two books and the editor of a third, which we'll be launching very shortly on the 13th of June, here at the centre, and we have the ABC's managing director, Mark Scott, who will be doing that launch, so I hope to see some of you there. Um, tonight, Matthew's going to address us on everything you haven't been told about media accountability and the Finkelstein Inquiry. Please welcome Professor Matthew Ricketts. Thank you, Margaret, for that introduction. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you can take it, you can all hear me? Yes? Okay. All right. Well, the most recent and persuasive case study showing why there's an urgent need for reform, urgent need to reform regulation of the news media in this country has been provided by the news media itself. And it's been provided in the way they've reported on the independent media inquiry. What they've done, in my view, is to under-report a lot of what was presented to the independent media inquiry late last year, and to either misreport the inquiry's findings or to ignore large parts of the report altogether. Anyone who actually relied on the mainstream news media for their knowledge of the media inquiry's report could be forgiven for thinking that we'd recommended that the federal government take a leaf out of Alan Jones's book and stuff freedom of the press into a sack and dump it at sea. What I'd like to do this evening is to clear away some of the thickets of misinformation and walk you through some of the material that was actually presented to the inquiry and show you how Mr Ray Finkelstein QC and I and those hired to assist us reached the conclusions we did and arrived at the recommendations we made. I'd also like to tell you about some of the material in the report that's not been discussed at all in the mainstream news media. And I'm going to use the phrase mainstream news media tonight because I'll be focusing on the Metropolitan Daily newspapers, their websites, and on radio and on television. Smaller independent news websites such as New Matilda and Crikey and some individual blogs covered the inquiry in detail and with a good deal of care. Now, I'm happy to acknowledge that at 468 pages, the inquiry's report could double as a doorstopper. And uh, that befitting a report to government, it's nobody's idea of a racy read. There are, by my count, two jokes in the entire report. And in one of these, the humour is decidedly mordant. And that was when David Simon, a former crime reporter and creator of the television series The Wire, told a Senate hearing in America that was looking into the changing business model's impact on investigative journalism, and I quote, it's going to be one of the great times to be a corrupt politician. So, at the outset, let me offer a little light relief from a cartoon in The New Yorker, which just happens to be a magazine that's a favourite of mine and of Mr Finkelstein's. Okay, um, let's remind ourselves of the terms of reference for the inquiry. There were basically, there were four, but there were basically two really. The 
The first one was to look at the way in which the, the systems for regulating the news media in this country operated, whether they were effective, whether they were meeting the challenges of the converging media environment and so on. And the second was the question that David Simon was alluding to, which is with the, changes, with the changes to the business model that has sustained uh, newspaper companies for many, many years, what effect are those changes having on the ability of newspaper companies to fund uh, what the in terms of reference call quality journalism, but what we in the inquiries report tended to refer to either as public service journalism or accountability journalism. So, the inquiry received about 10,600 submissions, the vast majority of which were facilitated by advocacy groups such as Avaz and Newsstand through the use of online forms. It's worth noting though that 762 of these submissions expressed dissatisfaction with the performance of the news media and only four expressed satisfaction. In addition, while the terms of reference didn't specifically ask the inquiry to consider the issue of concentration of media ownership, 444 submissions expressed concern about its effect and 115 submissions called for a fit and proper person test to be part of the media ownership arrangements in this country. Alongside these, the inquiry received a further 132 written submissions. It also heard from 41 people and organisations over eight days of public hearings in three capital cities. All right, so here are three things that were either underreported during the inquiry or not reported at all. On the very first day of public hearings in Melbourne on the 8th of November, Mr Finkelstein categorically ruled out any return to a licensing regime for the print media when the idea was floated by Stephen Main, the journalist and shareholder activist. Mr Finkelstein said that licensing meant the government decreeing who is able to publish news, which he said, and I quote, is as close to going back to the dark ages as you could find, as it represents probably an, as extreme an encroachment on news dissemination as you could get. This is relevant in the light of the dire extrapolations made about the inquiry report's recommendations. Second thing, Dennis Pearce was chair of the Press Council between 1998 and 2000, and apart from being an emeritus professor of law at ANU in Canberra, he's also been Commonwealth Ombudsman. In his presentation, he described, and I quote, as disgraceful a decision by the Australian to refuse to publish an adjudication by the Council about a complaint and, in fact, to withdraw from the Council for several months. The third item which didn't attract a great deal of attention was when Mr Greg Highwood, the Chief Executive of Fairfax Media, found himself unable to explain why news media companies could satisfactorily put in place Chinese walls between their editorial and their advertising departments to ensure that governments, which are major advertisers with newspapers, couldn't influence editorial policy, but that a regulatory body with even partial government funding would be inevitably and irretrievably compromised. On the first arrangement he said, and I quote, yes, certainly the government is a major client of Fairfax, so it's absolutely core to our business model that we separate editorial from commercial. We've done that and we will continue to do that. On the second arrangement, he said, the government funding a body like that, he meant the press council, would have, to make, would have the right to make judgments about what we do and we just don't see that as acceptable. Okay, so those are three things among more that were, were either underreported or missed altogether. The report was delivered um, as requested to the Communications Minister, Senator Stephen Conroy, on Tuesday the 28th of February and was released three days later on the 2nd of March. The main recommendations. Okay, there were two main recommendations. The first was to set up a news media council. Uh, 
as you can see. This is a body that was, the design was it was to cover, or the aim of it was to cover all media, not just print, but also online and radio and television. And it would also transfer the current broadcast media regulators' functions to it. Uh, the News Media Council, the aim of it was to have secure funding from government and its decisions made binding, but beyond that, government should have no role. It was explicitly stated in the report that the establishment of such a council was not about increasing the power of government or about imposing some form of censorship. It was about making the news media more accountable to those covered in the news and to the news, sorry, and to the public generally. And a point which was not really reported at the time was that a guiding principle behind the design of the News Media Council is that it would provide redress in ways that are consistent with the nature of journalism and journalism's democratic role. Okay, the second recommendation. Uh, this was on the question about the effect of the changes to the business model and whether there was a case for the government to intervene and provide some support to the industry because of a, a proven uh, diminution of quality journalism in this country. And, <coughs> excuse me. And what, um, what the report found there was that the situation here in Australia is not as dire as it is in America, where a large number of newspapers have closed. Um, there has, th that hasn't happened here. And so what the report said was, OK, this is a problem. We think it's an issue. It does need to be watched very co carefully, but there's no need for the government to intervene at this point. All right, so in that context, one of the ways of doing that was to give the proposed uh, News Media Council the ability to monitor what's going on in the industry, um, and if and if things were if there was perceived to be a genuine falling off of the of the amount and nature of quality journalism in this country, then then the matter could be revisited. Alrighty, so I just want to take you through a short selection of some of the misreporting or the overreaction to the inquiry's report, and the first one. Uh, in the Herald Sun on the day after the report's release, there was a piece whose headline uh, read, High Price to Pay. Inquiry wants taxpayer-funded watchdog to monitor your news. And in a breakout box headlined what they said, Mr Finkelstein was quoted as follows, as is on the screen here. OK, that gives you one picture. That quote is from page 10 of the, sorry, paragraph 10 of the executive summary of the report. Um, however, the preceding sentence before this one reads, these proposals are made at a time when polls consistently reveal low levels of trust in the media, when there is declining newspaper circulation, and when there are frequent controversies over media performance. And the succeeding sentence after the newspaper's breakout quote reads, Yet, a news media visibly living up to its own standards and enforcing its own high ideals is likely to increase rather than undermine public confidence and acceptance. What I'd say about that is that this kind of blatant cherry-picking of quotes is a pretty good way of undermining public confidence and trust in the media. Second, there was a panel discussion on ABC Radio's The World Today on Friday the 9th of March, and Ashley Hall, the reporter, finished it by asking Bob Cronin, Group Editor-in-Chief of West Australian Newspapers, about a comment that he'd made about the, that the inquiry's recommendations represented, and I quote, the most outrageous assault on our democracy in the history of the media. Ashley Hall asked him, but the notions that Mr Finkelstein's espousing of independence, balance, speedy corrections and apologies are already part of the various voluntary codes that cover journalism and media. 
What's the difference if it's enforceable and paid for by the government? To which Bob Cronin replied, the key difference under Mr Finkelstein's proposals is that editors could be jailed for, refu for refusing to publish statements demanded by the government-appointed regulator that the editor believed were completely untrue. Now, I mean that sort of thing was common when Joe Stalin was running the Soviet Union. And it's probably still very common in North Korea. But I wouldn't ever want to see a situation here where editors were jailed for standing up for their beliefs. Nor would I. But it appears to have escaped Mr Cronin's attention that under the government appointed regulator for the broadcast media in Australia, not only has no major radio or television station ever had its licence taken away, but those broadcasters who are routinely complained about, such as Alan Jones or John Laws or Kyle Sandilands, have suffered not much more than a slap on the wrist with a damp tissue. Finally, John Henningham. These days he runs a small private educational outlet in Brisbane called J School, but two decades ago he became the first professor of journalism in Australia. His contribution to the public discourse was to liken the proposed news media council to the Reich press chamber that existed in Adolf Hitler's Nazi Germany. In an article published in The Weekend Australian on the 17th of March, Mr Henningham writes that the Reich press chamber set up in 1933 by Hitler and his propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels was, quote, the beginning of a whole new censorship, sorry, the beginning of a whole new relationship between authoritarian governments and the press, not simply censoring information or jailing editors, but actively using the press as an instrument of propaganda. Print this or else. I don't intend to dignify this offensive comparison with a response, other than to say that whatever the Reich press chamber may have done after Hitler seized power, what happened beforehand is more instructive, according to Ron Rosenbaum's book Explaining Hitler. Hitler and his SA brown shirts murdered a number of their political opponents in the 1920s and early 1930s, each of which was reported in the Munich Post. The brown shirts destroyed the newspaper's office twice, and as soon as Hitler came to power, they came and dragged its journalists away to, and took, took them away to prison. The problem wasn't media regulation. The problem was Hitler's criminality. I cite Henningham's remarks as perhaps the most extreme example of the hostile coverage of the inquiry's report. It isn't surprising, though, that it appeared in The Australian which in the three weeks after the reports released, sorry, after the reports re was published, they published not one, but three editorials criticising it and at least 12 negative opinion pieces. In the same period, the newspaper, by my count, published one opinion piece that was reasonably balanced and two that approved of the report's recommendations. OK, so let's look at what is actually recommended and the reasons for it. It's relatively common ground, even among some commentators in the press, that the regulation of the news media in Australia is inconsistent, fragmented and ineffective. There's one body for regulating news and current affairs on radio and television, and another for regulating newspapers and, to an extent, magazines and online media. Is there any good reason for this? Well, not really. Or if there were sound historical reasons for the print media to campaign against the strictures of being licensed by a government, the prospect of a government licensing the press has been a dead issue for many, many years. Regulation was imposed on radio and then television, at least partly because the airwaves were a public resource and a scarce one at that. But that was not the only, or perhaps even the primary reason, broadcast media were regulated. The Broadcasting Services Act of 1992, which is the act that remains in force, expressly says a reason for regulating broadcast media, especially television, is because of its power to influence society. Now, the broadcast media in this country has been regulated for decades by a succession of government-created and funded bodies. The Australian Broadcasting Control Board, the Australian Broadcasting Tribunal, and most recently, the Australian Communications and Media Authority. And whatever grumbles and complaints those in the industry might have had, they have not generally extended 
to denying those bodies the right to exist. Newspapers are regulated by the Australian Press Council and have been since 1976. Three of the Council's past chairmen, as well as the current chair, gave written and verbal presentations to the inquiry, and all but one said that despite their best efforts, the Council does not work satisfactorily. The key problems are as follows. The industry can come and go from the Council as it pleases without suffering any penalty. The Council relies on the industry for its funding and there is evidence that the industry has used that or the threat of reducing funding to control the Council. The current chair of the Press Council, Professor Julian Disney, told the inquiry he needed double the level of funding to fulfil the Council's charter properly. The requirement that Press Council adjudications on complaints be published prominently in newspapers is honoured in the, in the breach. Most adjudications are published, but they're buried. A few are not published at all. Rarely are the adjudications written in the clear, far less the vigorous prose that characterises good journalism, and almost all are topped off by a vanilla plain headline along the lines of Press Council ruling. I think it seems safe to observe that no sub-editor has ever entered, let alone won, a Walkley Award for their wittiest complaint adjudication headline. While most press council chairs lamented the problems they faced, all three of the major print media companies, News Limited, Fairfax Media and West Australian newspapers, flatly said there was little, if anything, to worry about. Funding was adequate and it wasn't a problem that the companies could withdraw if they wanted to. Their attitude towards the reforms the current chair, Professor Disney, has been advocating ranged from bland indifference to outright hostility. At the same time, the inquiry analysed public views about the news media, its trustworthiness, its influence, ethics, intrusiveness, responsiveness to complaints and so on. And the inquiry did a good deal more than pluck out the annual Roy Morgan survey of attitudes towards various professions. It examined 21 separate surveys taken over 45 years between 1966 and 2011. And what these polls revealed was deep-seated and strongly held concerns about the performance of the news media in this country. Even more alarming was the way this material was blithely dismissed by various commentators in the media, either as, first, views based on ignorance, even though Dr Dennis Muller, on behalf of the inquiry, had sifted out polls whose method was questionable, or which asked for opinions about which ordinary people couldn't be expected to know much. Second, as what everyone knows people think about the media, as if that somehow erased its validity. And third, as clearly the product of a media studies wank. Now, I'm not making this up. This Mark Day, the Australian's media writer, described the inquiry's report as, quote, an academic wank in the opening paragraph of a feature piece he wrote on the 1st of May about the Convergence Review Committee's report. Instead, the newspaper media companies told the inquiry the most reliable barometer of their performance was their readers. If a newspaper was printing rubbish, people would stop reading it. Simple as that. Well, not so much. If it really was this simple, we, could con we would conclude that newspapers are printing a lot more rubbish now as overall circulation per head of population has been steadily declining for decades now. <laughs> There's actually a myriad of reasons why sales of newspapers rise and fall, of why individual readers start the newspaper reading habit and why they stop it, of why they read particular sections of newspapers to the exclusion of others, and so on. And notice I've been talking here about newspapers. The rise of online media throws up a whole range of other variables. So all these are good reasons why individual readers' decisions about whether to stop buying a newspaper don't carry a lot of weight. But there is another, even more compelling reason, and it was contributed by Dr Franco Papandreou, who brought to the inquiry expertise in the economics of the media, which is published in, among other places, the journal of the free market think tank, the Institute of Public Affairs. Chapter 3 of the inquiry's report shows 
but the sources of revenue for newspaper companies are as follows. Circulation, that is, revenue earned from the sale of newspapers to readers, accounts in most cases for significantly less than half of total revenue. The great bulk comes from advertising, whether classified or display advertising. Here's the relevant chart. Circulation revenue is red, the red bar. Print advertising revenue is the blue bar. The little green bar that you may not even be able to see is digital advertising revenue. The point's this, okay? Keeping advertisers happy is more important to newspaper executives than keeping readers happy. It has to be or they go out of business. Now, this doesn't mean that good editors and good journalists are indifferent to their readers, but when you hear newspaper executives mouthing the mantra that you don't need to worry about too much about media regulation because it's our readers who are going to provide true accountability, you're being fed a line that is first cousin to the tobacco industry's decades-long denial of the damaging effects of second-hand smoking. OK, to sum up the picture confronting the inquiry. Press Council is deeply concerned that it can't do its job properly. Everyday customers of the media have a host of concerns about it, but the news media industry thinks that, thinks that things are ticking over nicely, and we should all be focusing our gaze not on them, but on every other organisation in society which, if you believe what you see each day in the media, are led by clodpoles, careerists and malcontents. And as has been observed before about the news media, and I'm quoting all editorial writers ever do is come down to the field after the battle is over and bayonet the wounded. But where the news media can be content with pointing to others' failings, Mr Finkelstein and I were charged with not only analysing the problem but offering some solutions. And the problem is summed up in a report as thus. How do you accommodate the increasing and legitimate demand for press accountability but to do so in a way that doesn't increase state power or inhibit the vigorous democratic role the press should play or undermine the key rationales for free speech and a free, spe uh, sorry, free press. What the report recommends is that where complaints about media practice are upheld, the news media outlet will need to publish an apology, a correction or a retraction. A successful complainant will have a legally enforceable right of reply. Now, I'm not quite sure how this suppresses freedom of speech. Isn't its main effect to add to the amount of speech in society? Yes, the news media can chafe or may well chafe against being made, made to publish a reply. But remember, they had the first word in the matter and that if there is no adequate means for ordinary people to have their complaints taken seriously, then the news media can pretty well behave as much as, a law, as much as a law unto themselves. Professor Rod Tiffin, political scientist who worked on the inquiry, wrote in an opinion piece in the Financial Review on the 20th of March on this point, and I'm quoting, some publishers have said it's unreasonable that they should have to publish adjudications they consider to be wrong. That's Bob Cronin's point. But they already commit to do this under the Press Council. This objection is actually an assertion of their right to exercise censorship to restrict, not increase, information available to the public. The newspaper companies are actually arguing for their right to withhold from readers the news that their paper has been criticised. I'm going to repeat that because I think it's a very powerful sentence. They're arguing for their right to withhold from their readers the news that their paper has been criticised. That doesn't sound like Joe Stalin to me. As I've said, the response of the mainstream news media to this recommendation was near universal hostility. But why? As we've, se as we've seen, electronic news media is already regulated by a government-funded agency. The standards of journalistic practice that are being discussed would be drawn from the same standards and the same codes of ethics that all major news organisations have in place and that they say they believe in and uphold. The inquiry needed to ensure that any regulatory body had adequate and secure funding and the news media industry had clearly shown it wasn't going to guarantee that. 
The inquiry could have, said it, could have recommended a mechanism be set up to impose a levy on the industry, but the advice we received was that the costs of administering the levy could well be higher than the levy itself. However, that's certainly another method of securing funding that the government could consider. The inquiry's report explicitly acknowledged that concerns about potential government interference in regulating the news media are legitimate. It showed the relationship between executive government and the news media is fraught with tension and conflicts of interest. And to meet these current concerns, the proposed News Media Council was, was set up with a number of steps and safeguards in mind, from the way in which people were chosen to be part of it to the way in which its funding would be organised. its membership and so on. So, for example, I'll just quickly go through some of the steps um, for the, about the funding. Step one, the News Media Council was to identify the funds it, it claims it needs for a three-year period in a submission to the Auditor General. Triennial funding permits long-term planning and hinders the capacity for government interference. Second, this claim should be verified by the News Media Council's auditors as representing the News Media Council needs for that period. Third, the claim should be assessed by the Auditor General, who should then certify what ought to be provided. Fourth, if the executive, that is the executive government, decides that less than the amount certified the audit by the Auditor General is to be provided, the responsible minister should explain to Parliament the reasons for not providing the certified amount. Okay, now I wouldn't say any system is foolproof, but you can see at least there's a process in mind there to put checks and balances in place to lessen the likelihood of government interference. I'd also say that um, while the inquiry offers one solution, implicit in its discussion in the report is a recognition that there are others that could be offered and could be debated. Unfortunately, in my view, and I stress this is my view because it's come out since the inquiry's report was uh, released, the report of the Convergence Review Committee, released by the government at the start of this month, is not really an alternative solution, even though it's presented as such. The committee's report says that a government-funded news media council should be set up only in the last resort and places its faith in a continuation of an industry-based self-regulatory body. The committee then says this body that it's recommending would need appropriate funding and that any shortfall in funding from industry could be made up by government. It, said, it says members of the news media industry would be compelled to join and to provide it with adequate funding. But the committee is silent on how you can compel people to join a self-regulatory body. And it's also silent on how to overcome the opposition of the industry towards government funding. In other words, in my view, they seem to arrive at pretty much the same conclusion as Mr Finkelstein, but choose not to take the step that the logic of his position requires. The recent decision by West Australian newspapers to withdraw from the Press Council at precisely the moment Professor Disney had succeeded in persuading News Limited and Fairfax Media to increase both the amount and the certainty of funding for the Press Council underscores a core weakness of voluntary self-regulation for the news media. The Convergence Review Committee reports sidestepping of this thorny issue points, I think, to one possible reason for the hostility of the news media industry's response to the inquiry's report. It's well documented that the industry reacted strongly to what it perceived as politicians taking advantage of the public disquiet over the news of the world scandal to put pressure on news corporations' Australian arm. It also seems clear that journalists and editors react tribally to any suggestion of government interference in press freedom. These are not bad reasons, in my view. But if you take these positions and you stick with them no matter what, that means closing your mind to the substantive issues of failure of media performance and lack of genuine media accountability in this country. And that's what too many people in the, in the industry have been doing for too long, in my view. And it's another reason why the recommendations of the inquiry 
in my view, angered many in the industry. The pattern, by and large, with inquiries into the news media, both here and overseas, is that they find self-regulation is failing and they exhort industry to lift its game, to which industry solemnly nods, but then does next to nothing. Several years later, usually after a particular media atrocity, another inquiry is established and the cycle begins again. The subtext of the inquiry's report is to call this for what it is, a charade. It says to the industry, you've got sound standards of journalistic practice that you say you believe in, and you've had 35 years to make a success of the self-regulatory system for dealing with complaints about these standards, and you haven't. You actually seem to be content with that situation. So you've had your chance. If you won't do it, you've left us with little choice but to recommend some means of making this system work, and in your absence, that someone is going to have to be government. But really, guys, it shouldn't be such a big deal. All we are recommending is that you adhere to your own standards and that when you fall short of them, there's a prompt means of righting that wrong. That's really what it boils down to. I know it sounds beguilingly simple and it probably actually isn't. I'm happy to discuss some of the complexities of that further during questions if you want to take it up. The pattern of recommendations from media inquiries being ignored either by industry or by governments that commission such inquiries actually points to a key shift in the balance of power. When the great struggles for freedom of the press were being fought hundreds of years ago, the press, and it was always referred to as the press then, was mainly made up of lonely pamphleteers and small printeries standing up to the might of an autocratic monarch. Today, there are media empires that reach well beyond the boundaries of nation states. News Corporation is the best known and most topical example, but there are others. And I want to, this is from the report, I want to remind you of what the British Prime Minister David Cameron said at the height of the phone hacking scandal when it broke, really broke, last year. Over the decades on the watch of both Labor leaders and Conservative leaders, politicians and the press have spent time courting support, not confronting the problems. Alan Rusbridger, the editor of The Guardian, uh, the newspaper that, that broke and continues to run hard on the phone hacking scandal issue, gave the George Orwell lecture last year, and this is some of what he said. The simplest explanation for the lack of action is a combination of fear, dominance and immunity. People were frightened of this very big, very powerful company and the man who ran it, and News International knew it. They had become the untouchables of British public life. So what that, what that suggests to us is that elected governments then of any political colour may not intervene according to Paul Chadwick, the current Director of Editorial Standards at the ABC, but this is when he was writing about 1996. He said, so they're not going to intervene because, and I quote, media concentration has reached the point where no legislature would have the courage to enact a statutory scheme of journalism ethics and then to enforce it against the largest media outlets. Finally, I just want to point you to three sections of the inquiry's report that have barely been discussed anywhere. First, the level of government subsidy for the print media in Australia, which is contained in Annex Year K, a much under-read section. Given the strength with which various media executives have expressed opposition to the idea of, even the idea of government supporting the news media industry, you may be surprised to learn if you read through that section just how much support governments have given the print media in this country dating back to early in the 19th century and amounting to many millions of dollars. Okay, I won't go through all of the details, but they're there. Second, I want to say something about the laws of defamation. 
Uh, and what I would like to point out here is that the inquiry's report is actually scathing about their operation in this country. Oops, I missed it. Okay, they, um, they're costly. They cost a huge amount, it costs a huge amount of money to run a defamation action. Uh, an average figure would be in the order of $500,000. It takes a long time to even get to court six to 12 months, and then you've got the actual trial. Um, and nobody ends up very happy. So you have to be wealthy, you have to be persistent, uh, patient and persistent, and by that time, the original defamation, the thing that aggrieved you in the first place, is if it's not forgotten, it's so long ago, and the whole thing's taken over your life. So there's a section in the report about that which has been virtually not referred to in any of the media coverage. And I'm recalling a number of comments that were made in the media after the inquiry's report that criticised Mr Finkelstein for adopting a legalistic approach to the vagaries of the news media. But what we have here is a retired federal court judge saying that one of the core laws affecting the news media in this country doesn't work. Not for complainants, not for the media companies, not for anyone, perhaps except for the lawyers. Okay? The journalist in me says, that's an interesting story, but so far it's been virtually unreported. Finally, I want to mention the question of concentration of media ownership. In Franco Papandreou and Rod Tiffin, we had two uh, very senior academics who are part of an international research project um, being coordinated out of Columbia University in America that looks at levels of concentration of media ownership in 26 countries. 26 is just happens to be the number of the countries that they uh, could find research partners for and so on. There's obviously more than 26 countries in the world. This is the table. Apologies if it's a tad small for you to read, but we get the gold medal early. Okay? The top, if you look at the top two um, proportion of newspaper circulation held, uh, We've got one company that, that um, has 58% of it by this calculation. If you look at, that's News Limited. And if you look at the top two, News Limited and Fairfax Media, it's 86%. And this table excludes, the, the, the methodology of this particular study um, excludes the Northern Territory News, which is also owned by News Limited and by some counts, such as the Audit Bureau of Circulation, um, in this country, it's included, which would take the News Limited proportion up higher. It also doesn't include the Sunday newspapers, which, of which most in this country are owned by News Limited. So I wanted to draw your attention to, do that, to that because there, again, had been very little discussion of it or of the, some of the implications of it. And that's where I'd like to leave it for the moment. Thank you. take questions. Um, I'm going to chair the questions. Um, we do have some roving microphones, so if you've got a question to ask, please wait until the microphone reaches you. I am aware that we've got uh, a fair few members of the working media here tonight who, of course, can ask questions, but I would ask you to allow enough room for members of the public to ask questions as well, please. We're happy to stay around as long as we need to. Um, okay, there's a question there from Andrew. Matthew, did I hear you correctly? How many submissions were there to the inquiry and how many were saying that there was satisfaction about the media? Um, there were 10,600, uh, but as I said, a lot of those, the vast majority of those were, were you may, you, some people in here may have put them in, they're, they're facilitated by a group like Avaaz or Newsstand. You get sent on your email um, or your mobile phone a, kind of a form to fill in you can write whatever you like, but 
they're raising the issue for you, as in there is an inquiry going on into the media, slash the veterinary industry, slash whatever it might be. Um, we think it's an important issue. If you do too, send in this, send in this submission to government and uh, you know, make your voice heard. So they're making the process of, make, of doing a submission to government easy, and that's why, and we've got a lot of those, of, of the, uh, what did I read out? Of that total, um, and this is in the back of the inquiry's report if you want to uh, chase it up, 762 of them expressed dissatisfaction with the media and only four expressed satisfaction with the media. Testing. Uh, look, I, I hope you'll bear with me. I'd like to make a couple of very brief observations. Uh, firstly, the origins of the inquiry, following revelations about news of the world phone hacking. I'm, I'm uh, led to understand that there has been no evidence of phone hacking in Australia. So there's big hoo-ha over something that happened in the UK that hasn't happened in Australia, so let's have a, an investigation in Australia. The only hacking that I heard about was reports that The Age, journos at The Age, had hacked the Labor Party database of membership for some particular reason. Are you aware of that? Okay. So. Um, You've been talking about News Limited for the whole time, as have everyone else. The age doesn't seem to get too much of a mention there. But further, the, the media inquiry was called because apparently Bob Brown uh, said that he was unhappy. Uh, he said that publishers should be licensed, publishers should be fit and proper person test. Uh, there are some people in the community who would think that maybe there ought to be some fit and proper people in Parliament now. Uh, Craig Thompson, for example, mm -hmm. and there's no media uh, inquiry or witch hunt into people like that. So I, I'm not happy about that. <laughs> <coughs> well, uh, the, the Parliament is not engaging, has not engaged Mr. Rickardson. Okay, what's, what's the question you most want me well, to answer? Well, look, I, I actually attended one of your public meetings and I put forward a submission that I would rather one, two, or 22 rich media moguls printing or publishing nonsense that I don't have to buy or I don't have to read or I don't have to watch rather than one trumped up former uh, judge. Could you bring it to a uh, yes, I will. Um, proposing or uh, suggesting that he should be the arbiter. Now, one of the recommendations, one of the recommendations in this was that there would be a retired judge to look after it. How can the how can a retired judge do any better than the system that we've got now? Okay. Um, the, the proof would be in the pudding. Um, I should say that uh, Mr Finkelstein has no desire to be that retired judge in that role if, in fact, the News Media Council is set up. I think I can say that categorically. The gentleman in the red top. Uh, I'd like to just say that I think freedom of the press is one thing, but can anything be done about concerted campaigns of disinformation, confusion, misrepresentation in the press? And I have in mind what I see as the campaign being, have, being run over the last year or two by News Limited in all its media against the science of climate change. I think it's clear to everybody it's been a campaign. You can see various ones of its journalists. Ian, I'd ask you to keep I've it got the question. All right, sorry. Okay. I shouldn't go on and thank you. All right, so the, the question, if I'm right, the question is what can be done about campaigns? Yes. All right. First thing I'd say is that... Um, it's entirely um, proper for a newspaper to campaign on an issue. If they, if they wish to, in this state, many, many years ago, um, the age campaigned against the death penalty when uh, Ronald Ryan was um, to be hung. Uh, to, yeah, and so that's, I don't think that's an issue. If, um, what, what's an issue is 
if the news if the newspaper or the news outlet in its reporting either doesn't omits relevant facts that should be reported or distorts relevant facts um, or over overstates to the point of distortion the facts that it's gathered that's um, who's the person Patrick Daniel Moynihan uh, the US former senator said everybody's entitled to their own opinion you're not entitled to your own facts as in there's a distinction there uh, somebody more recently said the Tea Party had turned that on its head because they seem to be thinking that you're entitled to your own facts as well. So that, but that's the idea. Yes, you can campaign, but you still have to present the news as fairly accurately and diligently as you as you can. Is that? Again, I would just ask all questions. This is for questions, not speeches. If you want to speak at the centre, send me an email. <laughs> Matthew, in the um, in the views that were gathered about the media over 45 years, did you notice any direct correlation between the views on journalists and the views on media organisations? Um, the one of the most consistent uh, patterns in the in the um, in those opinion polls was the level of trust uh, that the average person or those surveyed, I should say, those surveyed had for the ABC at, for its news and current affairs, whether on radio or television. Um, there was I, I, I do have the report in front of me, but it's 468 pages, and I can't I don't know what page it is. But there was daylight between. The level of trust that those people surveyed had for the ABC and the way it does its journalism or its reporters do their journalism and other news organisations. Um, first of all, I just want to ask is the news media an industry? and if it is, why should it escape regulation like any other industry? Uh, I would describe, I mean, I have been describing it as an industry all night long, um, and uh, there, there are some good reasons that you need to be careful about the way an industry such as that is regulated, and it's because of the, the fact that uh, the news media and the political process, the government, are in each other's faces and spaces all the time, and and so there is a the, the 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 news media is close to the nexus of power and the way it's actually exerted in society. It's still the main conduit between um, the executive government and the average person, even though there's many other ways of getting news now. Still, what the what the online news surveys show us that is the way in which people are engaging with news online is that the mainstream news media companies are still occupying a lion's share of attention and space. So that's why they're important. And on the other side of the fence, the news media is not like any other industry in that it has the ability to lobby on its own behalf through its own outlets if it chooses to do so. Now, you might say that's an abuse of its own power. You wouldn't be the first to say that. But that's how it differs from, say, the pharmaceutical industry. Even from the mining industry, which has enormous power and wealth, but needed to spend $20 million or plus on an advertising campaign um, as part of its, whereas, you know, the, the, it's all there all the time with the news media. Thank you. Um, my question relates to uh, the quality of journalistic writing. Um, can I spend one minute on background? background? Try 30 seconds. 30, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. I, I've been studying the newspapers of Victoria for, for, in 1855. Uh, the quality of journalism and, and expression is marvellous. The quality of coverage is incredible, um, both um, overseas and local. Now, um, if you look at today's newspapers here, um, the quality of journalism 
is abysmal. Um, I recently uh, uh, looked through the Straits Times newspaper and the um, Financial Times newspaper, and uh, the uh, Australian newspapers seem to be somewhere in some very deep pit. So th the question relates to, um, can this uh, council or any other body uh, look at the quality of the journalism and see if somehow or other it can be resurrected? Um, I wouldn't look to a news media council to try and do that. I'm, I'm, I haven't looked at a lot of newspapers from the 19th century lately, but um, I, think, I think it's a case... Stephen Glover used to write about media for The Independent in England, made the point a few years ago that, um, in his view, newspapers these days, and he was talking broadly about the media, but specifically about newspapers, newspapers are both better and worse than they were in the past. There's, if you look at all sorts of things that were... Uh, I mean, the design of newspapers, the layout of them, um, the depth of coverage. I have looked at newspapers from the 1950s in quite some detail. It's much more superficial coverage in many ways than it was, you know, looking in the 1990s and so on. Um, but there are some things, other things, where you might well make an argument that there's not as good. Uh, but I don't think a news media council's job is to, is to try and sort of say, you know, you should be using the active voice instead of the passive voice and things like that. I just think that's, that's I mean, <laughs> there's been enough hostility to the idea of a government body looking at the media in the first place without asking them to check the grammar and the uh, vividness of the prose when, as we know, government departments are littered with phrases like in relation to and with regard to and in respect of and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, apologies, I missed the first few uh, minutes of the lecture, so you may have already covered this. You missed the only joke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is is there an equivalent body operating in another uh, another democracy, not in some uh, communist or fascist state, as is as it's yeah. often compared to? But is there another uh, government-funded regulatory body? Uh, like what you're proposing yeah. operating and, and if so, how does it operate? Yeah, good question and I don't have the detail on top of my, off the top of my head now but there are I think two or three um, press councils, call them what you will or bodies of that kind in, uh, not in you know, um, communist or socialist or dictatorial com com uh, countries that are either fully funded by government or partly funded by government and, um, and, and don't appear to uh, be... certainly don't appear to be worse from the, from the sort of articles that I was reading about them. There is also, um, as I said on a number of occasions, there's uh, government-funded um, and government-created regulation of the broadcast media, not only in this country, in many countries. That's, and, and, um, uh, so there's not a straight line you can draw between gut funding by government of regulator, a regulatory, regulatory body automatically means it's going to be bad. It could be, there could be some problems, but there are also many problems with voluntary self-regulation controlled by industry as well. Ken Haley. Um, Matthew, do you think uh, or do you believe or suspect that the hostility of News Limited, uh, in particular the Australian, to the findings of uh, the inquiry has anything to do with the fact that they have you labelled as an age type person because of your previous employment? Well, um, I, I have actually worked at the Australian for three and a bit years, um, and I've also worked at another uh, News Limited publication, the then Sunday Herald, uh, which eventually turned into the Sunday Herald Sun. Um, maybe, I don't know. I don't know, to be honest. Um, you haven't heard the old thing said before. <laughs> I try not to retail any rumours. 
No, I don't know. I mean, but you know, um, you could ask the representative of the Australian here tonight after after the session. If self-regulation isn't working, and so complaints to the press are not being acknowledged or are being acknowledged in a very oblique way, it means that it's very difficult for the public then to have any idea really what the extent of the problem is. Could you just very quickly give us some indication of what it is? What are the, the errors that, that aren't being acknowledged? Who's complaining? What, what kind of things are they complaining about? Oh, okay. Um, that's probably question better directed at Mr. Uh, Professor Disney, but, um, but it's a good point you raise in the sense that uh, uh, one, of the, one of the issues that the Press Council brought to the inquiry was the fact that a lot of people don't know about the Press Council's existence or the way it operates or what, the, what or how they can complain and they're confused about that even more these days with online media. Who would you, who would you go to about that? Um, the sorts of things that, that people do uh, complain about, you know, often it is poor grammar, um, those kind of things that really gets up some people's noses. Uh, inaccuracy in the reporting, um, perceived unfairness in the reporting. Um, I hesitate to use the word bias. I mean, lots of people um, do use the word bias. It's not a word I particularly like. Um, because it kind of attributes a motivation to someone when it actually might just simply be poor reporting. But, and that's in fact the point that Professor Disney made to the inquiry as well. Um, there is, I mean, uh, invasions of privacy upset people, um, particularly if it's your privacy that's been invaded. So those are some of the things, inaccuracy, unfairness, um, and inaccuracy can take a range of things, whether it's someone's name spelled incorrectly, the location of a particular event, etc. Those are the sorts of things. Um, it's in the report and it's in the um, submission from the press council, but I don't have the figures off the top of my head, but it is in there. And I'm happy to kind of, if you want to have a chat after, I'm happy to kind of show you some of that. We'll show you where to go to amid the 468 pages. Matthew, if it's your point that the media reporting is, has sought to erode the public trust uh, in the inquiry and demean its findings and its recommendations, primarily to uh, maintain the regulatory status quo or at least stave off any new regulatory framework, then to what extent do you think they're succeeding? Oh, look, I would, I would say uh, that that's been pretty successful so far. Um, it was one of the reasons I was particularly keen to, to give this talk tonight, to try and outline some of the things that the report actually says. Uh, the idea that, you know, press freedom is about to disappear, freedom of the press is about to disappear, and, and you know, I find that... I, I, if someone just said that to me, I'd be horrified. So, but that's actually not... I don't think that's going to happen, and that's why I've wanted to take you back to, well, what is the actual problem here? Um, and, OK, we know the origins of the inquiry. It's stated in the report, apart from everywhere else. Um, but what does that mean? Does that mean uh, you don't have a look at the nature of the regulatory system in this country for the news media? Um, that you would never do that because of the... The, uh, the, the so-called political origins of the inquiry. I, I took the view that, I mean, you could see that, but I took the view that 
uh, inquiries into the way in which the news media operates in this country happen rarely. They don't happen very often at all. And that the background that I have as both a journalist and as a, an academic who studied journalism, I thought meant that I was well placed to make a contribution. You know, I have no illusions about the, um, I well, not only no illusions, I don't know what the upshot of the contribution will be, where it will go, whether government will do anything with it, whether it will get through the parliament, whether it will be accepted, etc. I don't know. But it seems to me, as a citizen of this country, who's worked in the media and worked in academia, uh, whatever is happening over in England, I think there are problems with the way, with some aspects of the media's performance in this country, and with the system of accountability and regulation. The two things can be separate, and that's how I approached it. I'm not going to speak for anyone else, not my role, but that's how certainly I approached that issue and, you know, made as, the contribution as best I could. You've probably just uh, covered it off to a certain extent, but you mentioned earlier that some of the reasons the, uh, the press, the media brokers were uh, hostile towards inquiry was because of the timing and the view that they were perhaps taking, you know, advantage of the situation in the UK. Do you think the timing could have been better? Um, well, if, if you've kind of answered your own question. <laughs> um, uh, yes, I mean, uh, you, you, having said all of what I've just said before, um, where do inquiries come from? I mean, is there such a thing as a, as a um, purer than the driven snow origins of an inquiry into an area? I mean, they, they come out of, a, out of a perceived need. I mean, the... Um, what, what has been happening over in England uh, is, I don't think I'm con um, exaggerating to say, it's the, just about the biggest media scandal of the last 50 years. Okay? The company that, um, in which it, it appears to be happening is a global media company. Um, Murdoch is rightly praised for expanding and extending his uh, media company beyond Australia to America and to England before just about anyone else and more successfully and more comprehensively and there is a there is a lot of movement around his company by journalists and editors and advertising people and so on uh, that's the way that company operates and I'm not saying that it's criticism I'm saying that's one of the reasons it's been very successful as a company, as a global media company. So if something of that nature is happening there, I don't think it's at an all an unreasonable question to ask, might it be happening elsewhere in this company? Now, as has been said, there was no, there's no evidence in, that has been presented in the report, as in uh, reported on in the report, of phone hacking in this country. Um, we weren't presented with evidence. I don't know where, whether it's happening in this country. I know I made commentary at the time it was all happening last July that as far as I knew it wasn't happening. said that on a number of media outlets. But I don't think it's an unreasonable question to be asking. Any You mentioned early um, about the good reporting that New, New Matilda and online uh, smaller reply. outlets did of the report. Um, and I was kind of, at the moment, they're not regulated by the Australian Press Council and yeah. don't really fall under any regulation. Um, and in many ways, that's to their advantage that they can, kind of, it's difficult to get these smaller ventures up. Um, would they be regulated by? the new proposal and would that in any way possibly stifle the growth of more diverse online outlets? Um, they would be and there's, there's certainly been some concerns expressed that they would, that, that such a council would stifle um, uh, you know, their ability because they're small, they don't have a lot of money if, if, if they get confronted by a, a very vigorous dare I say, vexatious complainant. It's going to tie up a lot of time and energy on their part, which big mainstream media companies have enough resources to deal with those kinds of people, and they're, they're out there. You know, that, that would happen to 
to at News, at Fairfax, at the ABC, at any big media outlet. Um, so yeah, that's that's I wouldn't say that that's an issue. Um, the detail as to how you would uh, work that through, I think, needs more work to to try and ensure that that didn't happen. But this is my my view. I stress not not in the inquiry, uh, not in a report as such, because we didn't go into it in that level of depth. But I don't think that there would be a huge amount of you know. Um, vexatious complaints or difficult complaints or time-consuming complaints that a new Matilda uh, would have to deal with. It tends to happen more once you actually get a little bit of uh, leverage and coverage and, and, and are seen to have an impact. Um, if you're really, really small, people tend not to notice you. But yeah, it's an issue that needs more work. I don't need the mic. Unless you're being recorded. Yeah, just a moment. Uh, we are, I should say, well over time, but we don't want to close down questions on this issue of all issues, so we're prepared to keep going a bit longer. Um, and prepared to talk to any of you afterwards as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to give you a chance to editorialise. That report... You don't think I did that already? No. <laughs> <laughs> right. That report, how, in the next 10 years, or the next even 15 years, do you think there'll be another one right there where you are? and a person that's doing what exactly what you are doing right now. And the reason I ask that is because the inquiries are consistent, they're continuing, they say virtually the same thing all the time. We sit in this room and we say, we ask almost the same questions every time we're stuff, and nothing really changes. And I'm really concerned about this because yeah. the influence of papers to governments in England, all that sort of stuff. So do you believe you'll be standing there or someone equivalent? Um. Look, um, it's a good question. I, 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 in the paper, or in the discussion, I thought I talked about that in the sense that, there, yes, if you read the inquiries and the reports, um, similar things are said, and and not much is done. And I think, you know, when, the reason I quoted what the uh, British Prime Minister and Alan Rusbridger said was because of that, because um, the news media has enormous power. It is quite different from the way it was 200 years ago, and so. You know, governments do appear to be um, cowed often. I would also say, you know, gratuitous political comment for the evening that, you know, it's it's whatever you might say about the news media and the way, and I've been part of it, obviously. Um, you know, governments are cr governments contribute to this problem as well. Politicians contribute to this problem, um, just you know, just as much. Well, by by. Um, uh, you know, if they paid far less attention to what was in the media, if they didn't allow themselves to be run by the kind of spin cycle and uh, and those sorts of things, um, and if they didn't, I mean, that's the evidence of the Leveson inquiry and so on in in England is, is kind of that's spooling out in front of our eyes. The way in which politicians, it, indeed, it is hundreds of pages. That's what that's one of the things Cameron's saying. We we the politicians have been guilty here. Uh, so it takes two to tango. It's not a, it's not you know media bad, politicians good, or vice versa. This is a, this is one. Oh, I won't say. <laughs> it's a messy, messy dance. Well, partly it's up to ordinary citizens to kind of voice their views, take you know, and and say what you think, and make you know represent that to your parliamentarians, if not to your media outlets. Any further questions? Just sorry if it's repetitive, but just in a word, do you think you would be here tonight defending your report if it weren't for the collision of timing? For the news of the world phone hacking scandal. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know. Um, I'm, I prefer to say what I'm doing tonight is explaining my report. Well, not my report, I should say. It's Mr Finkelstein's report. I assisted him with it. Okay. Anybody who hasn't had a question and wishes to ask them? 
Uh, in that case, we've got two people who have had questions to ask for a second. Now that this gentleman has changed, so if you in the front row, I would ask for a question, not a speech. <laughs> uh, when the report first came out, I did have a look through, and I noted the uh, involvement of AVARS in the uh, responses that were received. I had a look on the internet, and I, f I formed the view that they are, in fact, an offshore and overseas activist group that has some affiliation with uh, our own GetUp. Uh, is that your understanding, that Avaaz is an, an overseas activist I group? Know. I don't know. Ah. Uh, uh, was it based in, in the, the US or elsewhere? Uh, sorry? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. And there is another gentleman who already had one question, so this will be the last one, I think. If anyone wants to talk to us afterwards, we're still here. Yeah. Uh, it's a very simple question. Uh, are we talking now about the first estate rather than the fourth? Who's the, who's the first estate? Sorry. <coughs> what do you mean? Are you, by talking about government, do you mean? No. Um, are, are we, are, have we promoted, or has, has it, has it oh, promoted itself, to be the first estate rather than the fourth? No, I don't think they're that powerful. But yeah, good. I like I like that question. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well we'll end it there. <laughs> so I can just uh, first of all thank the staff of the Centre for Advanced Journalism, Liz Chancellor Will and Brad Buller here. Without these people, these events wouldn't happen. Thank you for you and for staying that way. <laughs> Secondly, the 13th of June, a book called Australian Journalism Today, edited by Matthew Rickardson, uh, which also has uh, pieces in it by myself and other people associated with the centre, uh, will be launched uh, by the centre for, uh, at the Centre for Advanced Journalism by the ABC's Managing Director, Mark Scott, so hope to see some of you there. Uh, we also have another event next week, isn't it, Lucy? Um, Hacks and Hackers, which um, is a group of IT specialists and journalists talking about how they can work together. That will be an interactive session. Uh, details are on our website. You're all very welcome to attend that as well. Um, we'll be here for a few minutes if anybody wants to ask us questions. Thank you for your attendance tonight. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you.